I'm going to direct you to Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. We're going to look at society just before the great worldwide flood. You're familiar with Noah. You know the ark. But I trust that as we look at the text, we'll be challenged in terms of what Noah faced before the flood came and before he and his family entered the ark. I'm talking about insights that we might gather as we consider what Noah faced. And I suspect probably the greatest insight is one that I won't even really mention. It's the insight, don't miss the boat. Don't miss the boat. Make sure you're in the boat. And now we're going to press on in terms of seeing what God has for you and for me from the pages of His Word. Genesis 6, verses 1 through 8. And as we begin, I want you to note with me that first of all, Noah faced disaster approaching. Noah faced disaster approaching. Look with me at verses 1 through 4, Genesis 6. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Noah faced disaster approaching. And I want you to notice here, there are three characteristics in the first four verses of the pre-flood culture that Noah lived in. The pre-flood culture. Look at verses 1 and 2, and we just note there, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Now that phrase, sons of God, is a difficult one to try to interpret. In fact, you will find sincere Bible commentators who will differ concerning the interpretation of sons of God. If you want to wrestle in a Bible study, try to sort out sons of God that's here in the first two verses of Genesis 6. There are those who believe that sons of God refers to the line of Seth. Seth, a son of Adam and Eve. Seth was a godly line. And so the sons of God would be godly men who took for themselves daughters of men. These would have been ungodly ones. And the, the relationship with God would be compromised. Now, I'm not going to pursue that one because I don't think that's the best interpretation. For me, what I've come to is that sons of God refers to demon angels, fallen angels, who possess the bodies of men, and those men then married women, it's quite a, quite a, a sordid uh, story, but I'll tell you why I think these are demonized men 
who marry here in the first two verses. First of all, if you turn with me to Job, Job chapter 1 and verse 6. Job 1 and verse 6. Notice what we read there. Now there was a day when the sons of God, that's the same phrase, as in Genesis 6, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. If you'll turn to Job chapter 2 and verse 1, again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. Satan is here with these sons of God. And still in Job... If you go further into Job 38 and verse 7, Job 38 verse 7, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Again, sons of God in terms of angels and specifically fallen angels or demons. Now we notice if you go over into the New Testament, into 1 Peter chapter 3, we find something that I think is, is interesting here. 1 Peter 3, beginning of verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that He might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. This is talking about the time between Good Friday and that first Resurrection Sunday. Where was Jesus? Verse 19, In which also He, that is Jesus, went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Putting these verses together, it seems to me that I'm quite comfortable taking sons of God here in Genesis 6 as demonized men who married. This points to what you might call the perversion of marriage. When demon-possessed men take for themselves wives, marriage becomes perverted. We're living in such a day. Marriage has become perverted. We know that from the Supreme Court on down, decisions that have been made all point to the perversion of what used to be sacred marriage. We also notice here, not only marriage perverted, but in verse 3, in this pre-flood culture, there were days of grace. Days of grace. Look at verse 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. God gave the people 120 years to get right with him. As Noah was building this great ark out in the desert, they didn't know what rain was. They'd never seen rain before coming down from the heavens. And here was this Noah building a great boat. The people had 120 years to consider their relationship with God, to repent of their sins, to repent of the perverted marriages, among other things, but they didn't do it. God always has His days of grace. We're living in a in an age of grace right now, aren't we? God's judgment has not fallen yet in all of its totality, in all of its power, in all of its condemnation. So we're in a day of grace. But we can't count on that grace 
forever. The people in Noah's day had time. They didn't use the time. Loved ones, there are people all around us living within the shadow of the church doors as people are wont to say who do not know the Lord, who are not ready for the judgment. That should sober us in terms of the needs of people, perhaps people within our own families, our friends. This is a day of grace, but you can't count on that grace tomorrow, next week, next year. It could end quickly. Perverted marriages, and yet days, even years of grace, but also another characteristic of life in the pre-flood culture. There were men of renown, verse 4 there. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Men admired great men, physically imposing. Men of stature, men admired by the world, but rejected by God. And, and that's what should shake us. How many people today, whether in politics, in entertainment, in sports, are admired by the world of people? They have their hearing, they, they have their platform, and yet God has rejected them. What's important is not your standing before people or my standing. What's important is our standing with God. Our standing with God. Now this uh, Nephilim, these men of renown, they didn't survive the flood, but we meet Nephilim again in Numbers 13.33 when you remember the the spies went out to, to spy out the promised land and 10 of the 12 spies came back with a bad report. They said, the, the men there are great giants. We can't possibly go against them. But you remember two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb said, yes we can. In the strength of the Lord, we can take the land. So all of this was going on in that pre-flood culture. Marriage perverted, days, years of grace yet, and men of renown admired but rejected by God. This is disaster approaching. I want you to see next What we have in verse 5. Depravity abounding. Depravity abounding. Look at verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Notice the, the, the strong words here. Every, only, continually. This is the evil in people's hearts. It continued. Their thoughts were not of God. Their thoughts were not of creation. Their, their thoughts were only of evil and doing more and more evil. Sinning and sinning boldly. Depravity. 
abounding. Depravity is, is a soul that's filled with evil, a heart that is wicked, pursuing wicked actions. D.L. Moody, one time, the, the great evangelist of the 19th century, was once talking about the evil in the heart of people and how that evil, that, that sin nature, can only be changed by the power of God. And he was mentioning that some people look to education. If we only educate our people, that will make people better. People get better if they have education. And so Moody said, you can take a man who will go out and he, he'll steal nuts and bolts off a railroad track. And then you say, well, we're going to send him to college, get some education. He'll get better. But Moody said, what will happen is that that guy will come back from college all educated, and now he'll go out and steal the entire railroad track. Education doesn't cover, doesn't cover the need that people have, that you and I have, for transformation. And it's only the power of the Holy Spirit that can change a heart, change a life, transform a person, isn't it? Only. Only. And our God is able to do that. But in Noah's day, the hearts of people were evil continually. The thoughts intense of their hearts always gravitated toward that which was ungodly, perverted, wicked. And I agree with some commentators who say that we're getting very close to that today, in our day. Sad to say, but we're getting very close to that. That pre-flood culture of Noah. Disaster approaching, depravity abounding, but then destruction coming. Look with me at verses 6 and 7. The Lord was sorry that He had made man on the earth, and He was grieved in His heart. The Lord said, I will not... I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. Notice here, God's grief, first of all. He grieves what has happened with people. Verse 6, the Lord was sorry that He made man on the earth. He was grieved in His own heart. Now this wasn't a surprise to God. He's sovereign. He's all-knowing. But God can feel the sins of people. You remember Jesus when He approached Jerusalem? Jerusalem? Luke 19, verse 41, Jesus looked out on Jerusalem as He was coming into the city. This is at the beginning of the last week of His earthly life. And he looks out on the city. And what happens? He wept. Jesus wept for the people in Jerusalem. And He said, Oh, people, if you had... If you had only known in your day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes, you can't even find those things. Your hearts are so hard and cold toward God. And Jesus wept. Loud wailing and crying. It touched Him. He grieved over the loss of people.
God was sorry, our text says, that he had made man. His heart grieved. You think of the amazing love of God for sinful people like us. The heart love, the compassion, the care, all for us. You think of it. God wants a relationship. He wants fellowship with people. There's not much good to commend us to God. But God, in His grace, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved, what? The world, and that's the world of people. The world of people, sinful people, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Loved ones, we who are here, never take that for granted. Never be casual about that truth of John 3.16. Most people today don't know what you're talking about when you say John 3.16. Used to be they knew. They don't. Martin Luther said John 3.16 is the gospel in a nutshell. You want the gospel message? It's there. And you can go on in verses 17, 18, along with John 3, 16. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the only Son of God. Destruction coming. God grieves, but also God has a plan. Look with me at verse 7 of the text there in Genesis 6. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals, to creeping things, and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. You sense something of the the grief of God's heart. I'm sorry. These are people forming a culture where the Lord has no impact where they have rendered God irrelevant. They're caught up in what they're doing, and God grieves as Jesus wept before Jerusalem. This is pretty serious, beloved. But there is yet a fourth insight here, and it is verse 8 of the text. After Noah faced disaster approaching, and after he faced de depravity abounding, and after he faced destruction coming, verse 8 in our text, Noah faced a deluge overwhelming. Look at verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. You like that verse? Do you hear it? Noah found favor. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We know in verse 9, which follows our text, that from verse 9, we know Noah was a righteous man. He didn't find grace or favor because he obeyed God and was willing to build the ark. No, he was already a righteous man. 
A righteous man is one who has seen his sin, has turned from it, has repented, and has trusted by faith the Lord God and what God has said. John 1.12, but as many as received him who believed on his name, he gave the power or the right to become the children of God. Believing is receiving and receiving is believing. Noah was a believer before he ever began to obey God and build the ark. He's not working for anything. He's not performing for God. He is simply obeying God because earlier he believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. That's grace. Free, undeserved grace. But Noah found favor, as it says there, in the eyes of whom? The Lord. Now, this was all happening before the floods came, before the rains fell. 120 years the people had to repent, to listen to what Noah said as he proclaimed the word of God to the people, but they wouldn't hear. And then one day, abruptly, powerfully, the judgment of God fell. The judgment of God fell. Look with me at Matthew. This is a kind of a Bible study we're doing tonight, folks. I hope you're following me uh, with this now. We're, we're, doing, uh, we're, we're going just uh, a little further in Bible study. Matthew chapter 24. Thirty-seven through thirty-nine. We have to come to this, Matthew twenty-four, and beginning at verse, actually thirty-six. Let's pick it up there. Jesus is is speaking, and he says, "But of that day and hour, no one knows." That is, the the end of history. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like, what? The days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of of the Son of Man be. People were living, at least from an outward perspective, living normal lives. Buying, selling, going about their business, getting married, having families. And yet, the flood came as an interruption. Stop the people in their tracks. Isn't that what this pandemic did as we entered into 2020 over a year ago? We got stopped in our tracks. Everything was going along and all of a sudden there was an abrupt halt and the pa pandemic made such an impact, and even continues, so that we wonder, can life ever be the same again? Listen, loved ones, we haven't seen anything yet. When the judgment of God falls, there will be no more time, 
there'll be no more opportunity to get things together. It will be too late. That's what Jesus is emphasizing here. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming days, before His coming. I would submit to you that it could be that these days in which we're living now might be the beginning of the end. We don't know for sure in terms of specific dates and times, but this could well be a time when it may be the last opportunity for generations of our people to get right with God, for our missionaries out there to do their proclaiming and teaching, and for us here to not only announce the coming of the Lord, but to help prepare people for that coming. He's coming again. He's coming again. Have you thought much about that lately? Are you homesick for heaven at all? It seems with what we're facing more and more, God has a way of making us a little more homesick for heaven. Because this life isn't all it's cracked up to be. And sin abounds. God has given us this life. We enjoy it. We take it as a blessing from God. We want to live this life to the full. But loved ones, are you ready for the appearing of the Son of Man? Are you ready? And I don't mean with a, just a laid-back Christianity that sits back and lets things run their course, but are you ready for the coming in terms of where your belief is, where your faith is? where your salvation is. A lot of church people think that it's not only Jesus who saves, but Jesus plus performing for God, doing good works for God, parading a Christian life, looking like a perfect person. No, absolutely not. We're saved by grace that's none of ourselves. It is the gift of God, none of works, lest anyone should boast. And I'm so thankful for the grace of God. I need the grace of God. I depend upon the grace of God. I'm not saved without the grace of God, His favor. The same favor that Noah had. The same favor. The same grace that caused Noah to build that great ark. And Noah, his wife, and three sons, their wives, eight persons saved through those waters. And it was the ark that was the salvation. Now here it comes. What's the ark? What's the ark today? What's the ark of your salvation? What's the ark of my salvation? It's Jesus. It is Jesus. It is what He provided for us at the cross. His redemption, where He bought us back from sin, from eternal death, and from hell itself. The ark of refuge is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that ark of refuge still avails for sinners today. People like you and me. Beloved the first doctrine denied in Scripture that the devil denied to Adam and Eve was the doctrine of the judgment of God. Go ahead and partake of the 
the fruit, you won't die. God had said, no, if you eat from that tree, you're going to die. That was judgment. Satan denied it. We need to be reminded in looking at the pre-flood culture of Noah that God's judgment will never be denied. Are you in the ark tonight? Are you in the ark of safety? If so, hallelujah, praise the Lord. It's all of grace. We can sing, we can shout. We can sing hallelujah. But if you're not in that ark of safety, why not now? Why not right now? Before the judgment falls, and it'll be too late. He's coming, loved ones. He's coming. That's His promise. May you and I be found ready in the ark, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. What a Savior we have. Amen.